You're listening to That Gratitude Guy podcast with David George Brooke. That Gratitude Guy. Learn about how gratitude turns what you have into enough through stories of motivation and inspiration. Wherever you are in your life and whatever you're going through, That Gratitude Guy is here to help you achieve great things and live a happier, healthier life. Change the way you live today right here with David George Brooke. That Gratitude Guy, starting now. Hi, everyone. Welcome to That Gratitude Guy podcast. I am David George Brooke, That Gratitude Guy, your host. Whereas you know, my mission is to have guests that relate and recall moments of their lives that were propelled and energized by utilizing the power of a gratitude mindset. You can expect to get some tips and takeaways as you do every week from my special guests. My podcast is downloaded every Tuesday morning at 5 a.m. Pacific Standard and now Pacific Daylight Time on the Transformation Talk Radio Network. It's also available on Apple, Spotify, and Google. And please subscribe and give me a five-star rating if you like what you hear. I always appreciate that. And just as a quick mention, I do gratitude keynote speaking and gratitude coaching, and you can reach me at thatgratitudeguy.com. And as you can see on the YouTube channel, thatgratitudeguypodcast.com as well. And the contact information and any of the links are in the show notes as well. So let me get on with the show. As I say every week, my favorite part, of course, is my guest, no exception this week, Suzanne Taylor. A couple of things to understand about Suzanne. I believe in challenging the status quo, thinking differently, and to boldly step into the confidence of being unique and different. I believe that enhancing by enhancing your unique qualities, strengths, and gifts, that perspectives change and grows, changes and grows. I believe my lifetime of learning the deep mastery of personal habits and emotional intelligence can shift your life and business trajectory. Trajectory, one of my favorite words, by the way. Uh, I believe coaching is custom, unique, and co-created with actionable steps. Resources for straight, simple, straightforward motivation and momentum. Suzanne has condensed 35 years of experience and study in exercise, nutrition, holistic living, and delivers it in a 16-step process for living your best life. This practical approach to well-being can be delivered within the containers of coaching, workshops, or seminars for individuals and corporations. Since 2009, Suzanne has supported entrepreneurs, practice owners, and leaders to grow personally and professionally. She is a technology wizard and a master certified coach, 10,000 plus hours with a unique coaching background and a unique and a genuine interest rather in seeing others succeed. Suzanne, welcome to the program. Wow, she sounds awesome. She does sound awesome. Do you know her at all? <laughs> I do. I know her really, really well. I'm glad, I'm glad to hear that. So let me start out with my favorite first question for the listeners and viewers. How did we meet how did we meet? We were uh, both hosting a podcast on Transformation Talk Radio, and uh, part of that was a community, and we met in that community and uh, connected on a one-on-one, -on -one, and the conversation has grown ever since. That is exactly right, and so what I like to do when sort of, it doesn't always have to be chronological, but I like to at least look at somebody's life and their work experience and some of their personal experiences are very impactful in a chronological order. So take us for the listener that doesn't know Suzanne Taylor King, take us back to maybe college, high school, college type things and how kind of the journey that you started on and we'll get to how it got to where you are now, but what, how did it kind of start way back when? Well, I was an only child. Um, and I, I think one of my first memories is being the leader, or as I was known then, the instigator of my friend group. Mm. Um, so that friend group uh, in the early years consisted of my neighborhood, which was mostly boys. Um, as I got older, uh, expanded into, you know, girls and boys. And I was the idea person. I was the, come on, let's do this person. I was fearless. I was bold in my vocabulary and expressing my feelings, which was always tried to uh, quiet, quiet down was always the recommendation. Oh, she talks too much. She's too expressive. Uh, she says what she feels. Uh, I remember liking a boy in, in seventh grade, uh, he was the new kid at school. And if he happens to be listening, he knows who he is. Um, I walked right up to him and I said, mm, 
you and me, I think we need to be a thing. And girls, girls didn't do that in seventh grade. Right. Um, and I, I think from, I think that came from my athletic ability. Uh, I was always a fabulous swimmer and got into surfing in my early teen years, which again was a boy dominated sport. And I was fearless in the water. So I think that combination of being fearless and having that innate confidence and leadership skills, it was, it was just there. And now I can look back on it and say, well, that's kind of always who I was. Well, that's pretty cool. And when I think about some of those things, an idea person, fearless leadership, fabulous swimmer, uh, seventh grade, let's see, what are we about 13, 12, mm -hmm. 13, 14, right in there. I think you and I should, should go out or whatever you said to that, that young man, where, where do you, as you look back on it, where do you think those qualities came from? Because as an idea person that, that all talks, that all speaks to leadership. Where do you think that came from? I really don't know, except that my parents um, were a little bit older than everybody else's parents. And my mom was very confident, very like supermodel attractive. And my dad was very confident athlete and very funny. And they took me everywhere with them. So from very early on, I was good at interacting with adults where, you know, some other children couldn't, you know, have conversations with adults. Uh, so I think that was probably the foundation of it. And you know, what's interesting, I was brought up with three brothers and a sister, there was five of us. And I, I'm sure there's been many books written about this, uh, I can only imagine, but just the advantages and disadvantages of being an only child versus having multiple siblings. Because I think each one of them has an advantage. And, Absolutely. And for you having a father that was, <clears throat> excuse me, that was funny and a mom that was almost like a supermodel and took you everywhere. And you could probably argue that that helped you. I don't know if I'd say grow up faster, but have a better, more rounded, maybe look at things from a younger age than the average child. Don't you think? I think so. I mean, <laughs> I, think, I think there was you know, my dad's athletic ability, I always admired it um, because of the circle of friends that he had that revolved around bicycling and how they would look up to my dad as, you know, the leader of the group sort of. Uh, and my dad was probably in his middle 40s and most of the guys he was cycling with were between 25 and 35. Wow. And so that was like super appealing to me. I was like, wow, you know, here's my dad, 45, which, you know, I thought was old. And he's hanging out with guys 10, 15, 20 years younger, and they're having trouble keeping up with him. Wow, that's and I loved that. Mm -hmm. That's really, really cool, too. And how about you mentioned athletics? So how did that kind of uh, segue into the swimming? I know the swimming as you said, a fabulous swimmer, but talk a little bit about the swimming career because I know that was a big part of your growing up. Well, I think that was at first something all of my friends were doing in the summer. You know, we joined the swim club, you joined the swim team. Um, and it was just something that everybody did in my neighborhood. But I quickly realized there was uh, backstroke was my stroke and um I don't know, it was just something natural about the water. I had water skied at 12. I had been surfing, you know, 12 or 13 years old. Um, and I, I was fearless when it came to trying and pushing myself in the water. Um, jumping out of a plane, not so much. Put me in a pool, I'll pretty much try anything. So and where was with um, all those water sports too, uh, uh, surfing and all that kind of thing, where'd you grow up? South Jersey, oh, South, South Jersey, Jersey, but did a lot of traveling uh, up and down the East Coast as I got a little bit older. Uh, high school boyfriend was a big surfer. So, you know, North Carolina, Nags had Florida, um, spent some time in California in college doing some snowboarding and surfing. So uh, the, the swimming was really the kickoff of it all, realizing that um, I could be an individual 
and exceed my expectations, but still on a team. Yeah. Well, and all those sports that you did, very active, not only water sports, but other things as well. Clearly, the swimming kind of dominated. So talk about the journey on swimming, because I remember when you and I first met, you'd miss I went, wow, that's pretty cool. And to where to the levels that you got with that and that what that maybe taught you along the way, too. Mm. I, well, I think the biggest lesson was not not to quit. Uh, mm. I wanted many times to to quit. I wanted just to be normal or just to not have something to do in the summer. And I can remember being about 17, 16 or 17, and I got a summer job. And of course it was working at a swim club and swim practice was before work. So that meant, you know, when my friends were going out at night, sleeping in in the morning and showing up to work at the mall at 10 or 11 a.m., I was in the pool at 530 wow. at work by eight and I and sometimes riding my bike to the pool. Mm -hmm. um, so there was an amount of energy that's required to ride your bike to then swim a couple miles in the pool in the morning and then work all day and then ride your bike home. Mm -hmm. There's a certain amount of food that's required, water that's required, sleep right. that's required. And I think that's where that um, self-care or that athletic mindset just came intuitively. Well, uh, the that's, word, that's the only way to explain it. Exactly. And the word that comes to me, which I just would imagine this maybe set the groundwork for you is discipline. Mm. I mean, the average kid, and I think I've known it about swimming, but for some reason, following the Olympics and different things over the years, it's, it's the ice skating one that how many times on the rink there, how many times they're on the ice and the, the training and then the coach and, you know, and this two hours before school, two hours in the middle and two hours. I mean, I'm going, Oh my goodness, the average person. So I just have to imagine that really developed your discipline for the rest of your life. I think so. It, it, I stopped, I stopped competitive swimming after high school, but I think it set me up for knowing what I needed to do if I wanted to achieve a goal, yeah. whether it was an athletic goal, a fitness goal, uh, a weight loss goal, an eating goal, um, keeping promises to yourself. It, you know, it's easy to keep promises to other people. True. True. But when you tell yourself, I'm, I'm going to get up at 530 and I'm going to ride my bike, you know, 20 minutes, I'm going to get in a 60 degree pool on a 65 degree morning and swim till I warm up. Um, that, that takes, I, I guess, grit. I, I, it takes wanting what's on the other side of that. Uh, and I've always been very clear on what I wanted to achieve. Well, and it taught, that's a great point. And it taught me a lot about accountability. And I think it's one of the most, literally one of the most powerful things somebody ever said to me, because if I said to Susan, to Suzanne, uh, I'll meet you at the pool at 530. I'm just the mm -hmm. kind of person I think you are too. I know you are. I wouldn't be, I wouldn't only not, not make it. I would be early. I'd be there at yeah. 520 because I'm on time and I have my towel and I'm ready to go and stuff. Mm -hmm. But if you called me or in this day and age text and says, I can't make it, why don't you go ahead without me? I may or may not make it. You know, it's mm. now it's kind of 50 50 because I, I wouldn't. And so somebody said this to me and it just still rings in my brain to this day. And I think about it all the time. Wow. Isn't that interesting? You'll make a commitment to a friend, but not to yourself. Yeah. <laughs> I just went, oh, Lord. I said that that's such a good point. You know, so so you may or may not make it. It's 100 percent sure if you're going to meet her there because you have mm -hmm. you honor that commitment. They may or may not make it, too. So, well, segue a little bit from that into the career. Because you have quite interesting career, and I want to make sure we talk about your daughter too. But just in going, just talk about the career a little bit and how that uh, started for you, and as it kind of you know weaved its way along your life. Um, well, I went to college uh, to be a dental hygienist um, on a whim, actually. Um, a, a house down the street from me, where I grew up, uh, was purchased by a young single woman and she had an MG convertible 
and I pranced myself right down to her house when I was a junior or a senior. And I said, welcome to the neighborhood. What do you do for a living? <laughs> and she said, I'm a dental hygienist. And I said, oh, went to the dentist the next time. And I asked my family dentist, how do I be that? And he gave me some information. And I said, how much would I make if I worked here? And, you know, we're talking 1985 at mm -hmm. that point. And he said, oh, you would make about $30 an hour. And I was like, oh, <laughs> sold, sold. So I, I went to school for that. Uh, I have a degree in applied science. And through that process, just fell in love with chemistry, microbiology, human anatomy. And in my 20 year career as a hygienist, I went back to school for nutrition, um, some health coaching in within the dental practice and realized I was great at building rapport with people. I was great at human connection. I was great at making people feel comfortable in uncomfortable situations. People opened up to me. They loved talking to me. And I think that was my favorite part of the job. And so when it came time to um, get married and have a child, my son is now 13, um, I thought I'm gonna change careers. And when I really looked at what could I do, I mean, the world's open, right? Like, what could I do? I, all the things that we just talked about, the building rapport with people, helping people, uh, I'm super intuitive, I'm outgoing. Um, I have this vast knowledge of nutrition and personal development and performance. How could I take those things and, and maybe add one or two others and do something with that? And everybody thought I was crazy. Uh, and I talked, I took a Tony Robbins seminar mm. and in the seminar, um, we were asked what we used to do for a living. You know, what do we do for a living? And I, and I typed in the, the chat dental hygienist. And this is the very first time I was on zoom and I saw him look at dental hygienist and he said, who's the dental hygienist? You will be the perfect coach. You know how to do, to build rapport. You know how to interact with people. Your, your whole career was going to a waiting room, calling someone's name. And by the time they walk back to your room, they're laying back in the chair, inviting you into their body. It will be so easy for you as a coach to have people invite you into their mind. Are you ready for that? Mm. I was like, I just felt like a different person after that seminar. And that was about 10 years ago. I never thought about that. So that's kind of a cool thing when you're talking about building your rapport and the communication. I'm a big fan of Tony Robbins, like a lot of people. And then I always get a kick out of people that, uh, oh, that woo woo science and they go mm -hmm. whatever you and I in personal development, which I've been into personal development as long as I can remember. I just think it's interesting. But what was, speaking of interesting, what was the impetus to go, when you mentioned the dental hygienist and the gal with the MG and welcome to the neighborhood and so on. And then when you started doing that at the 30 an hour and so on, what, what sort of was the impetus for the sliding into the nutritional health piece? Was that <laughs> something you experienced or saw other yeah. people that weren't as healthy? How did that happen? Uh, my mom passed away mm. um, on her birthday while I was on the phone with her. And I was 35 at the time, unmarried, no kids. And um, it, was, it was a really dark time for me, the two weeks that followed that. Um, but being the resilient, gritty person I am, I looked at it as an opportunity to not... Um, have poor health and to help more people live a life of their choosing rather than what they kind of end up falling into. Um, and I, I really, I thank, you know, my parents for a wonderful 
childhood, but they both passed away very young um, because of a lot of poor health choices. Oh, wow. And my mom was only 67 mm. when she passed. I was 35. And that was really the catalyst for me saying, I, I want to do something more than clean people's teeth. Very important job, necessary job. But for me, I want to have more of a difference in people's lives, in mm -hmm. their emotions, in their uh, happiness. Mm -hmm. And did you find in going into that, did you start by putting together programs or things for people or how did it kind of manifest itself into where you are today, where you have all these, these programs, these different modules, things you can do to help people? How did that kind of come about? Um, I met a, a person who was a positive psychology teacher and we had a conversation and he said, you know, you have, you, you have a concept, you have an overview of what positive psychology is. And I would love for you to, to experience my 10 month certificate program in positive psychology. Mm -hmm. And I think it was $10,000 and I, you know my we had just adopted my son at that point and i was like no i can't i can't do that right now he's like no no i'm not asking you to pay i'm asking you to be my ta wow and i said so you're you're gonna you're gonna give me this program and all i have to do is make sure everybody's fed and has drinks and I take notes and I film you and I take pictures and blah, blah, blah. And he said, yes. I said, deal, I'm in. Wow. And um, the first day of class, he talked about resilience and I cried. Mm -hmm. And I thought, that's, that's what I am. And I've never had a word for it before. So positive psychology and that type of coaching, um, the mindsets of grit and resilience and positivity and happiness and joy and motivation and commitment and all of those things, I built the foundation in my health coaching practice. And that was so easy for me. And positive psychology was like the bow on healthy lifestyle. So you can have a healthy body, you can eat right, you can exercise, you can sleep right, you can meditate every day. But if your mindset's in the toilet, mm -hmm. that was that was the the bow on the package uh, that I offer. Um, and I tried for years to fit it into a container. And now I, I, I don't really fit it into a container. I help entrepreneurs, um, mostly because that's who I'm around, that, that creative uh, mindset, authors, speakers, other coaches, small business owners, and just using all the knowledge that I've gained over the years to help them move their life and business forward. And I want to talk about in the, that in a second, but I want to come back to the uh, resilience and the positive psychology for the people that may or may not know define the positive psychology how that is how would you define that uh i would describe it as traditional psychology asks the question what's wrong with you mm -hmm. what was wrong with you mm -hmm. and analyzes your past to explain your present positive psychology asks what's right with you, mm. what's good with you, and asks you to look forward and plan your future. Let me get some notes. I like that because I had a, I remember somebody asked me once as a coach myself there, so what's the difference between a coach and a um, counselor, therapist, psychiatrist, psychologist, whatever. And um, I don't know who, who said this to me originally, but I really kind of liked it because you just said the past versus what's wrong with you, versus what's right with you, and what's your future. And the way it was kind of described is they said, I love the one to 10 scale. I use it in my gratitude journal and a lot of little exercises that you use on my speaking. But it was a therapist or a counselor kind of takes you from minus 10 to zero. 
Mm. And a coach takes you from zero to plus 10. And, yeah. and that really is kind of the past and the future. And I think sometimes too, just thinking about, as you mentioned, the traditional model, what's wrong with you? And I think if you spend too much time thinking about what's wrong with you, uh, you're going to be, you know, what's the old thing about if you look back to the past and you're going to keep repeating it over and over again, if you keep focusing mm -hmm. on it too much. And um, I can't remember the cliche I want there, but I just think that's so important. I've said again, in talks about the, the windshield in your car is about four feet wide, about two feet deep and the rear view mirror is about like this. And you should probably look at your life about in proportion, yeah. mostly about 80 or 90% what's in front of you. You can learn a little bit from the past, but that's pretty small. And, and then just mostly focus on the future and things. So, so as you're helping these, Oh, before I get to that resilience, talk to mm -hmm. me about what were the elements for you to be resilient? Because I'm fresh off a talk and I was thinking about this group yesterday and I was saying, you know, the problem is, is there's unfortunately many, many destructive and deadly coping mechanisms. And we're all looking for coping mechanisms. And when I talk about gratitude is that gratitude guy, it's all about focusing on what you have and your blessings and abundance and not worrying about your lack. And it's making mm -hmm. your strengths productive, make your weaknesses irrelevant. Gratitude turns what you have into enough. So it's, it's very much about that. What were some of the elements to the resilience piece when you found out, you know, you said on that first day of class and what, what sort of added to that to make, hit that, you know, ring, ring that bell with you and go, wow, that's me. How did that, how would that happen? Well, I've had, I've had so many setbacks, like, like other people have, you know, nothing about my setbacks are tremendously uh, special in any way, but it's the way I bounce back from them. So resilience to me is bouncing back better than before whatever setback. Um, so for instance, you know, the passing of my mom, how do you bounce back better from that? Um, you know, numerous other things that, you know, that could be a whole hour long talk about the things bouncing back from. But I think what, what really hit me was one of my first clients as a life coach had very similar struggles to me in her life. And we were about the same age. And where she made choices during her struggles, I made the opposite choice. And so it made me look at, hmm, so when her father passed, she turned to alcohol as a coping me mechanism. Mm -hmm. When my mom passed, I turned to school and study and learning, like let's improve myself as a coping mechanism. Hmm. Well, let's look at that. Like, what does that mean for the average person? You know, the average person might not have meditation skills. They might not have a love of learning. They might not have uh, the ability to do what I did, but you can still bounce back better from a challenge, whether it's bullying, discrimination, um, failing a test, uh, losing a, a boyfriend or a spouse or a child, for God's sakes. We've seen um, Alex's lemonade stand always comes to mind. The mom who started that charity because she lost her son to mm -hmm. cancer. Yeah. Yeah. And it's interesting. You mentioned earlier about your folks and an only child and, and, um, but then maybe there's some many advantages of that because then they were older when they had you and so forth. Mm -hmm. And it sounds just from what you said, reading between the lines a little bit, that they maybe made some choices that weren't as healthy for them that may have shortened their life, perhaps. I was talking to a doctor the other day and, and this, this particular doctor contended that 70 to 80% of our life is determined by our genetics and maybe mm. even higher. So mm. that's a pretty high number, but yeah. my attitude is even if it's only 10 or 20 or 30%, how about we control that? You know, And that means the smoking, the drinking, the drugs, the lifestyle choices and all these things. Yes. You know, exercising, meditating, being hydrated, writing a gratitude journal, you name it and stuff. But as you think back in honor of your mom and dad, what would you say is the biggest, if you could just pick one thing, the biggest thing you learned that was positive from your mom and from your dad? Hmm. I think it was family time, um, hmm. family meal time, uh, every night, same time, every night, be there, be square, right? Um, there was always something green on the plate. 
there was always, we talked about our day. I always felt listened to. Mm. Um, and creating that environment for my son was very important. That's why I never had kids earlier in life. I wasn't ready for that. Mm -hmm. um, and when I met my husband, we had conversations about that. And I think that's one of the things that attracted him to me was because he didn't have that mm -hmm. when he was a kid. So uh, I definitely wanted to cultivate that, that family, you know, even though there was only three of us and now here I'm creating that same thing, the three of yeah. us. And, you know, just we're in the process of coming out of the pandemic and it's, it's mm -hmm. been almost exactly two years, but it looks like we're on the other side, thankfully, who knew it would last this long. But one of the things I mentioned in the silver linings to the pandemic uh, that, you know, pop, people saw so much negative is this creation of family time. Mm -hmm. And when I grew up, there was five of us, as I mentioned, but I mean, it was, there were seven of us at the dinner table every night at six o'clock. You didn't, you know, you made it there and you talked about your day and the whole thing. And it was just, that went away. And of course, a lot of it was latchkey kids and single parents and all that, that changed mm -hmm. in the seventies and eighties and nineties. But still, that was a big silver lining for these last two years, I think, where people came back to the family dinner table. What's happened to that? And, and of course, now, I guess if they're there, you, you know, put all the cell phones in the basket on the center. You're not looking at your cell phone or yeah. it might be and stuff, too. But, but it's, well, we'll talk about, so where you are kind of now in your coaching, uh, again, just sort of some of the things that are the most current types of I don't want to say programs, but thoughts that you have around what you're coaching, combining all these years of knowledge that you've done and this resilience and this ability to, you know, I love the welcome to the neighborhood. You know, how do you, how much, what do you do? I'm a dental hygienist. I think yeah. so it tells me a lot about your personality, which I kind of mind <laughs> yeah. a little bit, but, but kind of tell me the most current iteration of where Suzanne is now. Well, I think um, it's much bolder than it used to be. It's uh, standing in my values and my, my beliefs that if you hire a coach, you should have my phone number mm -hmm. and we should have a relationship where it's just you and I, maybe you're part of a group as well. And, you know, my mastermind group, I have about 18 people in that, but they still all have my phone number. I'm not uh, on a pedestal mm -hmm. somewhere and out of reach. Um, so we're co-creating that mastermind experience yeah. with their questions and their struggles and where they're at in their business. And I love, love that I'm able to do that and call that knowledge, call it wisdom, call it uh, higher intelligence, universal intelligence, whatever you want to call it. I'm able to give that to a room full of people and um, now that I realize it and stand in it more, it's much more successful. Uh, right. My one on one clients vary uh, different professions uh, to a whole entire businesses. And I like to think of myself as that overhead view of your business, uh, the person who's capable of being up there at 10,000 feet and looking down on your business. And I typically see someone's potential uh, or where they could go more than they do. Mm -hmm. And I typically start off a coaching relationship with the question, have you thought of doing X, Y, Z, or yeah. have you thought of mm -hmm. bringing that to a podcast or a book or, a, and asking curious questions um, you know, kind of fire starter questions, I call them. It doesn't leave me needing to sell myself in the traditional sense. It, it sparks conversation. Yeah. And from sure. conversation, um, I, I think what is created is a relationship Yeah. and it's a relationship where there's something I have in my head that could help my client move to where they want to go faster. Well said. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Well, I have a couple of questions left and then we are going to wrap up. Yeah. 
what is the best thing about being the mother to a 13 year old son? Oh, um, still seeing the baby in him, still feeling that. And my son is adopted and I was the first one to hold him at the hospital. I'm going to get a little, uh, uh, cosmic here. Um, we are so connected, like soul level connected from minute one that it changed my belief in God, in destiny, in what's meant to be. He did that for me, along with his birth mom who chose us for him. And I look at him every day and he is the child I dreamed of having in my 20s. Wow. That's so cool. Yeah. What a great line. So, Miss Suzanne Taylor King, your last question. Mm -hmm. And you get to pick one thing. What do you know today that you like to, would have liked to have known at 18 that would have helped you? And you get to pick one thing. Hmm. You don't have to marry the boy that your parents love. That's a good one. And I think getting to know you, something about, I can see that you kind of know, I mean, I think we need to be an item when you're in seventh grade, you and me. I mean, I think that tells me a lot from, a, from an early age. Uh, so I, I think... It's, I, I've told Connor, my uh, younger son is 27, and, and since, and my older son is 37, and I've told him along the way, you can ask me, what do you think I should do? Mm -hmm. I said, but I'm not going to answer that. I'm going to give you the two choices you tell me you have. I'm going to give you the pros and cons of each choice. I love that. And then you make the choice. I just think it's so important. And so the parents, in this case, you know, here's the boy we think you should marry. Uh, thanks, mom. Thanks, dad. Appreciate it thumbs up, but not quite what I had in mind, you know? And so mm -hmm. this ultimately somebody said, and so true. If your kids are happy, you're usually happy and typically, and that's what makes you happy. And I think you just want the best for your children. And one yeah. of the things I want them to do is be, it's like something in that I'll never forget when Connor moved from Seattle to San Diego and a few years into it, I remember I sat at the airport and cried for a couple hours when he said goodbye to me. I just still, even to this day, it still gets me upset when he moved 1,300 miles away. But I asked him a few years later, what are you most proud of in your life? And he didn't even hesitate. He said, um, I'm proud of the fact I could move 1,300 miles away and start my own life and be wow. totally independent as much as he and I are very close. And uh, it kind of reminds my older son made a comment when you talk about pods of psychology and then we will wrap up. And I said, you took a four-year degree or two-year degree on psychology. What's the biggest thing you learned? And he didn't even hesitate. He goes, people are unpredictable. <laughs> That's such a great line. So I love it. So, well, thank you, Miss Suzanne Taylor King. And let me tell the listeners again, my podcast is downloaded every Tuesday morning at 5 a.m. Pacific Daylight Time on the Transformation Talk Radio Network, available on Apple, Spotify, and Google. Please subscribe and give me a five-star rating if you like what you hear. Always, always appreciated. And I do know that people are struggling with all sorts of life issues and may need additional support. All sorts of issues out there, anxiety, depression, jobs, health, family, financial issues, and so forth. I have a gratitude protein program that can propel you forward to achieve anything your mind can conceive. It also helps you to dramatically shorten your learning curve and get a derailed life back on track. I offer a 30-minute complimentary coaching consultation to help you with some on-the-spot coaching and see if I might be able to help. If you're interested to schedule a 30-minute coaching consultation, please text the word COACH to 206-371-8309. That's the word COACH, C-O-A-C-H, to 206-371-8309. And any additional information on my keynote speaking or books or journals and so forth, you can get at thatgratitudeguide.com, my website. Also, a lot of people like to get my Monday Morning Minute. It goes out every Monday, a 60-second gratitude promotional or inspirational, I should say, more than promotional video. 
And if you'd like that, go to your text and text in the number 22828. That's five digits, 22828. And then the message box, put in gratitude guy, all one word, and that'll get you connected to the Monday morning minute. So lastly, thank you so much for tuning in, watching on YouTube and listening on the Transformation Talk Radio Network. That's it for this week. Thank you again. And remember, be grateful and never quit. So long. Thank you for listening to That Gratitude Guy podcast with David George Brooke, where living with gratitude turns what you have into enough. Transformation starts now and you have everything you need to achieve great things. In a world that is constantly changing, there is motivation and inspiration right in front of us. And you can find yours right now. Don't wait. Visit thatgratitudeguy.com to get started living with gratitude today.